Um, it's my pleasure uh, this afternoon, this morning, whatever, uh, to have uh, Magda Kaufmann as our speaker here. Uh, she will talk about her favorite topic, imperatives, which is a very important topic altogether, I think. Uh, let me have a few words about her. After studying linguistics and computer science in Vienna, she did her PhD in 2006 at the University of Frankfurt with Edith Zimmermann at the graduate program on sentence types, variation, and interpretation. And this sort of stayed her topic more or less since then, I think, um, with some other uh, variations. Um, after four years as a junior professor in, in Göttingen, she went uh, to the University of Connecticut in 2012, where she is currently associate professor at the Institute of Linguistics or Department of Linguistics. Um, she's now in Vienna, so on our time zone. Uh, the Frankfurt graduate program, as I mentioned already, was in some sense crucial uh, for her because uh, closed types remained a fixture of her research. Um, Magda is in particularly known by uh, for her work on commands and imperatives. Uh, I would like to mention her influential monograph of 2012 and many other articles. Um, there are also more recent work, like, for example, a handbook article that will come out soon. It's on the account. Um, and this is a comprehensive overview of theories on imperatives. Uh, and she will talk about this topic here as well. Uh, her work actually is wider than imperatives, I should say. Um, she's worked on uh, topics relating to speech acts in general. Um, and uh, also on modality, of course, on deontic modality, because there is a close relation to imperatives, but also on other types of modality. Um, and uh, I would also like to mention her work on conditionals, including, of course, conditional imperatives, but also others, and on discourse markers. Again, uh, discourse markers that relate to imperatives, like German ruhig, um, but also other discourse markers. She has contributed to aspect and habituals and uh, a number of other topics. And she has worked on a wider variety of languages, including Japanese and Tagalog. And our commentator is Dan Harris. I'm very pleased that he agreed to do this work on commenting. Um, uh, he is assistant professor at, uh, in philosophy at Hunter College at uh, City University of New York where he is the founder and organizer of the New York Philosophy of Language Workshop. Uh, I think this is in person, so they cannot uh, just join in uh, from remote, but of course, in person meetings are very important too, as we increasingly learn now too. So then received his PhD under the supervision of Stephen Neal uh, on speech at uh, theoretic semantics, a topic that is very close to our series. And his areas of interests are, of course, philosophy of language, but also of mind and, and uh, cognitive science and uh, analytic philosophy in general. He is uh, the co-editor of a very important collection, the New Work on Speech Acts collection uh, of 2018, where he uh, also has an outline uh, article of uh, the landscape of theories about speech acts. And I'm also very curious about the articles that you uh, design as forthcoming on social and political applications of speech and theory. And I think there are a number of people uh, here that consider the social aspects of speech acts uh, as very important. And we are looking forward to that. And if we have copy, a copy of that before publication, I would be very happy to see it. Dan has also worked on imperatives, for example, on an article on imperative inference and practical rationality. Uh, he knows Magda's work, and I think he is an ideal sparing partner uh, in this uh, presentation with commentary. And so I uh, stop now and ask you, Magda, to share your screen and go ahead with your presentation. Well, thanks so much for the invitation and thanks so much for this very generous and kind um, uh, introduction that will be very hard to live up to. Um, but let me start and I will here um, share 
my presentation, which you hopefully can see. Very can good, see. thanks. Okay, that's great. Thank you. That's good news. Um, so it says a compositional take on directive micro variation, and I should warn you, it should probably be towards because the compositional part will mostly be concerned with how we can put together the meanings um, from smaller parts, and I will have lesser to say about how they could actually be encoded in the syntactic structure, but I assume that um, what I'm doing here might be the first uh, step towards taking it back to then uh, the syntactic encoding. And uh, to start, um, here's the general, probably to this lecture series, very familiar um, puzzle, how to relate uh, sentential form types with a specific elocutionary potentials. Clearly, there's a difference between an imperative like open the window and the declarative like you will open the window. But the imperative is fit for commanding, requesting, giving advice, suggestions, invitations, expressing acquiescence, wishes and so on, probably more, but it is definitely unfit for assertions. And um, uh, Kevin Fintel and Sabina Trido remark quite um, uh, accurately that proposals about the meaning of imperatives are package deals of a denotational semantics and the dynamic pragmatics. And um, to follow up on this, they distinguish two types of theories, strong theories that in, in themselves encode uh, modality, elocutionary um, specifications or intentional specifications um, in the conventional semantics of the imperative uh, with minimal theories that assume objects that don't have these kinds of meanings in them. And you can find some references listed here, hopefully. Um, well, certainly not exhaustive, but some representative works. You can find this. Thing. And um, I think the best uh, worked out, fully worked out minimal theory with a the dynamic pragmatics is um, Paul Porton's work, which builds on a core idea that um, contextual representations have storage sites for objects of different types. So for propositions, for sets of propositions and for properties. And we use uh, conditions uh, for speech. Act, there's a use condition for speech act fit syntactic objects, which basically says updates the storage site that corresponds in logical type. And with that, we are nicely predicting the universal prevalence of three main clause types. Um, namely that we have declaratives denoting propositions which serve to update the common grounds or storage of mutual um, joint belief, interrogatives, um, sets of propositions that can update the question set, and imperatives, uh, properties uh, that are um, suitable to update the to-do list of the adversary. And these to-do lists are structured into the antipolitic and teleolog teleological subparts. And most importantly, they determine what counts as rational behavior. So that is their role in the conversational game. And um, more recently in this very lecture series, um, uh, Paul has specified the idea of what speech act fit objects are. And these should be clauses that have a speech act projection uh, CP. Um, uh, in them or on them, probably. And that can explain why, for instance, if you have something like being you and opening the window, even though this seems to have the same meaning as open the window might have on his theory, um, given that it has the wrong kind of uh, syntactic signature, if you like, it will not um, perform this effect of updating the RCS to-do list, so it will not behave like an imperative, and that's good news. Um, so this picture, and nice that it is, as it is, faces, I think, uh, two challenges. And uh, the one is um, the fact that not all imperatives are in a way to do's. The fact that the theory that is minimal in the semantics has a heavier burden in the pragmatics risks that the effect is so specific um, that it does not cover all the speech acts that can be carried out with imperatives. With the caveat of here, uh, focusing on imperatives that we can think of as um, direct speech acts. Um, what exactly a direct speech act is, is probably um, in the sense of surreal, uh, direct versus indirect. One test for this is uh, what uh, that I've been using is the reporting test going back to Irene Heim's um, MA thesis. Um, so for instance, if you consider an imperative in response to, can I have ice cream now, finish your pasta first, um, I would assume that this is, in some sense, also an indirect speech act. So 
be denied A's request to immediate ice cream uh, by ordering A to finish his pasta. So this uh, by report uh, kind of tells us that the denial, or even if you wanted to say assertion that they cannot have ice cream or whatever sort of speech act you wanted here is indirect. In contrast to that, invitations or permissions are direct. Have a cookie, no thanks, I'm fine. It's very odd to report A's move as A offered B a cookie by telling them to have one. And, um, and in fact, um, uh, in uh, 2010, uh, uh, Paul has a paper where he um, assumes that these imperatives have a certain special marking that introduces choice and reconciles the problem with a to-do list. If you don't want to say that have a cookie places on the addresses to-do list, something that then um, constrains them to actually have a cookie. Um, however, there's other cases like wish imperatives that can also have settled states of affairs. These also seem direct by the reporting test, but they are not naturally effective in any way on a to-do list. So please don't have broken another vase. Uh, Kulikov and Chekhov's classic example, please be rich or be rich with a suitable in intonation. Um, these are settled states of affairs. So whatever the adversary does, um, it doesn't make them more or less rational to strive to have um, a settled state of affairs uh, or a property that's already settled. Um, in that sense, um, the to-do to list approach doesn't really have to say much about these cases. The other problem, and that's the one I'm, I'm mostly interested in here, is actually that um, the three major clause types that we have nicely predicted don't exhaust the inventory of clause of syntactic objects used for speech acts. Um, in addition, we have root infinitables, subjunctives, perfect participles, that clauses, and so on, that can have a functional potential similar to or overlapping with imperatives. So just focusing on the imperative category here. And um, these are minor clause types, and in this spe special case, minor directives. So from German, aufstehen, aufgestanden, these are well known to have meanings that are very roughly like the imperative get up. Um, which we would also have in German, of course. Now, the interesting thing is that if these minor directives encode the same minimal semantics, they should behave exactly like imperatives. But that's not what they do. So um, setting aside embedding, which is an interesting but different question, there are, I think, at least three main differences. The elocutionary force potential itself, the tolerance um, of indexicals, and the tolerance of modal particles. So um, the latter two points associated with a uh, work of Paul Fortner himself, but also um, Hans Martin Gärtner, who's also here. Um, and, and these are the things I would like to uh, look at um, a bit more here. If we want to stick with the minimal semantics, if there are these differences, it would seem that we would need a different minimal semantics. And um, Paul himself, um, in, in a joint work with Mio Pak and Raffaella Zanuttini, has a very interesting starting point in the sense that he suggests that um, no relation to the adversary is activated in at least some of these uh, minor cross types. Or possibly in a recent squib that they are overall deficient in their context dependence. Again, I think this is a very promising starting point, but it also leaves open a series of questions. So, what is then the content of the speech act projection, which we still need so that the object does um, get assigned elocutionary force? Um, also, um, if, if assuming um, as they do in their work that um, encoding speaker adversary relation is um, one of the things that happens in this projection. And um, how does the lack of the adversary relatedness impact the range of um, possible elocutionary forces in the sense that we're observing this difference in elocutionary force potential? We do have different types of minimal directives, so this cannot be um, the only um, difference between uh, minor directives and um, imperatives. And finally, there's an empirical issue, as I think the indexical intolerance um, merits um, revisiting. All that said, I do think that if we address all these points, we may end up with a strong theory anyway. So that's um, kind of my hunch. And with that, I will start out with a strong theory, in fact, and see how um, it can be combined with these ideas and probably um, lead us to a theory of imperatives and minor directives. 
to do that, I would like to first focus on practical infelicities um, that reveal imperative meaning. Um, the one point is practical mood sentences in the sense of um, Mandelkern here, and the other is uh, the distancing ban. So both are things I have thought about um, in previous work, um, but the Mandelkern paper also um, offers a nice new take on this. So what does he have in mind with practical more sentences? He observes, building on um, Philip Nynan's work, that directive clauses, orders, uh, conjoined with a vowel of them coming to, are infelicitous. And this is independent of the form type. So we have this with models. You must turn in your final paper by the end of the exam period. Imperatives, turn your pa final paper in by the end of the exam period. Um, explicit performatives, I order you to turn in your, formal, uh, your final paper by the end of the exam period. Whatever you use following it up with, but I don't know if you will turn your paper in by then, is infelicitous. And he observes the similarity to the classical Moore paradox, it is raining, but I don't believe it is raining. However, he says that there are many situations in which practical Moore sentences can be true, um, like the classical ones, and in which they can be believed and known, and in which either conjunct on its own can be felicitously asserted, like um, unlike the classical. And from that, he concludes that at least in these cases, it is not an issue of content, no matter what you want to do with the classical more paradox. Now, it might be surprising that he says a suitable and knowable at least for the sequences containing, uh, containing imperatives like 7b, and this is um, somewhat um, inappropriate or startling, uh, but we can think about something like issuable while knowing the second part or something like that, which is certainly um, felicitous. Okay, and um, his idea is that um, these practical more sentences can be schematized, um, as I have it here, um, order phi and open, um, not phi, so um, there's a possibility that phi is not um, obeyed. And his claim is that this is an issue with posturing. posturing. When you order someone to phi, you must act towards them as if you believe that they will phi. And um, one of our students at UConn, CK Lee, uh, suggests fake it or you won't make it as a slogan to capture the posturing idea. Now, um, this idea that this is not an issue of semantics, um, Matthew Malcolm supports this by saying, well, they are intuitively believable and knowable. There's nothing wrong with thinking that the address you won't obey. Um, the second point is that there are no practical more effects with descriptive uses of the same material. And that practical more sentences are fine in embedded occurrences. So I will take in the uh, first two uh, points here a bit and um, skip the uh, um, embeddings. The finding overall is that his arguments aren't equally applicable to all linguistic types of practical more sentences. And I think that strongly suggests a role for conventional encoding after all. So um, we do know um, that the practical more sentences involve performative uses, but that the models also have descriptive uses. So this is um, uh, an old idea. And um, this can happen with overt source modification as I have it in nine. According to local custom, you have to take exactly two lumps of sugar in your coffee, but you should not feel bound by local custom. And for all I know, you will take more than two. So here we have a practical more sentence, it seems that's perfectly fine. But what has happened is that instead of you have to take exactly two lumps of sugar, uh, instead of that being an order, the modification according to local custom has turned it into a descriptive statement about what is necessary according to the local custom. However, these modifications are not, are not absolutely necessary. So we do find cases without, as in 10, um, the client asks, what is my legal obligation? What do you expect me to do? And the lawyer goes, you have to report your liability, but I don't know if you will. You may prefer to push the limits of the law and just conceal it. So again, you have the practical more sentence. You have to, I don't know if you will. And um, uh, Matthew Malcolm reports this as acceptable. So that's uh, for have to. However, it's interesting that if we swap out have to with must, 
um, things are somewhat different. Nine still works with the over source modification you can have according to local custom. You must take exactly two lumps, but you should not feel bound and so on. It's fine. If you try it for the lawyer example, as because report actually that it is um, considerably more marked and indeed not as good. So it's not so easy to get uh, rid of the practical more effect uh, with must. And that's probably also unsurprising given um, the Lipnainen's original paper on this topic. Imperatives are um, even more resilient here. They lack the descriptive uses and dislike the over source modification. Take two lumps of sugar. Um, that's not true. Um, is about as bad as saying, uh, reporting this by she made an assertion. And um, in line with this, uh, the over source modification, according to local custom, take exactly two lumps of sugar um, is felt to be weird. So in that sense, um, this is not a way of avoiding the practical more effect for the imperative. So for the imperative, it could still be um, a matter of semantics. Um, the other argument that um, Matthew Mandelkorn um, indeed offers for imperatives is um, to plug them into indifferent sequences. Close the window, don't close the window. I don't care at all. Um, you might close the window, but close it, don't close it. What do I care? So it seems that here in the second case, we have the practical more sentence, but we don't get the practical more effect. So it's fine to say that I don't know if you will do it. However, um, I'm a little doubtful about what the indifferent sequences tell us here. Um, with the declarative clause as well. You closed the window, you didn't close the window, I don't care at all. It seems that um, there's a general absence of, absence of commitment or maybe even a case of uh, speech act denegation. So um, I'm a little hesitant uh, to build on these and I have a bit more data on them later if anyone is interested. Um, in contrast, the second case is considering permissions, I feel uh, are more like disjunctive orders after all, um, as far as practical more is concerned, you can have only one piece of fruit, have a pear, have an apple, I don't know which one you'll take, so there's a might not for both of these imperatives, however, if you follow up with I know you might not take one, um, I feel that's considerably more marked, so it's not that we don't have a practical more effect, it's just that what the speaker is committing to is that one of the thing is happen things is happening, but they are not committing uh, to either of them happening, so posturing on the disjunction seems good enough here. So it seems that imperatives cannot be pushed into descriptive uses and in all committing uses considered so far, the practical more sentences result. What about the second practical infelicity, um, the distancing ban? This is what originally Annette Frank in her dissertation considered an analog between the ontic modality and classical more sentences. You should go to Paris, but I don't advise you to. And um, in my work on imperatives and also a joint work with Adrian Stigowitz, we call this the distancing ban, go to Paris, but I absolutely don't want you to go. And um, thanks um, to um, interaction also with people like Philippe Schlenker, um, I realized that you really have to use something like I absolutely don't want you to go. So it has to be a strong preference um, in order to get uh, the badness effect here. Again, models escape at least with overt, um, in the case of must, sometimes also covert have to source modifications or something like according to. Um, so you can make these good if you make it clear that the source is different. It's not you, but someone else. And in the cross-linguistic comparison, um, I would like to skip the details here. It turns out that, for instance, Japanese Becky and Nakereba Naranai, which are both necessity models, mirror this um, contrast between must and have, uh, have to, in the sense that Becky is also um, behaves like must in really needing an overt source modification versus Nakereba Naranai. It's more like have to in being okay. Uh, with even in the absence of an overt uh, source modification and not giving us the practical implicities. So that seems that there is a class of default subjective models like must and Becky that behave a little bit like imperatives if you don't overtly modify, modify them. Here's the Japanese data that I'll just skip. Um, so we do see some um, effect of um, conventional uh, semantics triggering practical infelicities. 
And um, I would like to update um, Matthew Mendelskwan's take a little bit to say that the practical move sentences reflect indeed a conflict that the layer of conversational moves, speech acts, if you so like. So I think he's very right about that. But some forms are constrained um, to more paradoxical uses. So it is a matter of semantics after all, contrary to what he says. And that is the case always for imperatives with one um, caveat that we'll have to get back to. And without overt source modification, this holds for default subjective models like English must or Japanese Becky. And um, our practical move sentences then result from a conflict in conversational moves, but the tie to the relevant directive like conversational move is conventionally encoded in some forms. So for the imperatives and um, to some extent for these uh, default subjective models. And at that point, um, we might go back to this um, tempting idea to make imperatives conventionally um, directive. But as we all know, they have a lot of non-directive uses like disinterested advice. How do I get to Holland, take the A train, invitations, have another cookie, can I open the window, sure, open it, um, expressing acquiescence. Um, okay, then go to that then party, concessions, please be blonde, wishes, things like that. And um, one attempt um, at an elocutionary underspecified semantics is this modal operator account um, that I've been um, spending decades on at this point. And, and the idea is to use a modal operator that is underspecified in modal flavor. So that's what um, Angelica Kratzer has been postulating for models. Um, and um, to add presuppositions that restrict felicitous model flavors, like, um, and in, in this case, um, I would like to assume that the default subjective models partly share these um, uh, as preferences or defaults, these restrictions. That's why in the absence of overt source modifications, they do behave a lot like imperatives for the practical infelicities. And um, to get this um, approach off the ground, we have to classify imperatives by the kinds of speech acts they are used for. And the idea is that all but wish imperatives are practical, so they convey what to do, a solution to a decision problem. And wish imperatives are possible, but they are severely restricted. They don't come for free. Konrafti and Lauer tell us only if it is taken for granted that speak and advocacy have no influence on the realization of the content which is clearly the case with uh, settled prejacents. Please have the keys with you. Please don't have broken another vase. Please be rich. Please don't be dead, Jenny, things like that. And limited, we have language specific, uh, a language specific inventory of well wishes in the adversary's interest where lack of full control is taken for granted, like get well soon, have a good life. Um, get work done on the train, even if we do know that there is lack of control is already way worse. There's some back and forth in the recent literature, um, but um, roughly that's the finding we have here. Um, now to interpret uh, the models and the directives later, um, I would like to assume that um, prioritizing models and imperatives are indexed for the contextually salient prioritizing, so deontic, poetic, teleological, model flavor, are, so glossing over um, model backgrounds and ordering sources possibly just using an accessibility relation. You must close the door, close the door, are mapped on just um, a modalized proposition. It is necessary according to the model flavor R that you close the door and um, interpret it standardly um, as a tour of the world if the addressee closes the door in all worlds that are accessible according to um, how we interpret this model flavor in this context from the world of evaluation. So just standard um, necessity. And whenever we find weak imperatives like invitations, we can try to derive them pragmatically as I've tried, or just assume that the model force here in necessity is really underspecified and starts out as possibility that for instance, gets exhaustified or something along these lines. Okay. And um, to avoid um, the assertive uses, um, I um, have introduced this notion of performative contexts where models like must fi are used performatively in a performative context, else they are used descriptively. 
And um, imperatives presuppose that the context is performative. So by uttering an imperative, the speaker becomes publicly committed to believing that the context has the required properties, the properties a performative context has. And um, finally, uh, speakers become publicly committed to believing the proposition expressed, um, but that doesn't mean that it has to be an assertion at the speech act level. So following um, Stolnik's um, comments on this. So this is basically uh, the dynamic pragmatics part uh, that I'm assuming in this proposal. And now um, in uh, recent work, I was interested in um, what the individuals are exactly that are conventionally um, referenced by the imperative semantics. And I'm thinking of performative contexts involving an interplay between a director with source of practical knowledge and an instigator with an agent in control of a course of events. And um, if we have second person matrix imperatives with falling intonation, then we have the director as uh, set to the speaker and the instigator set to the addressee. So this is your regular second person morphosyntactic imperative. Minor directives, for instance, subjunctives with non-second person subjects can reset the instigator. Moreover, embedding in speech reports, for instance, or question formation to the extent that that is compatible with the directive course that meaning can also reset um, the director um, uh, parameter to an individual other than the speaker. And um, so what are the properties we are ascribing to performative contexts for second person models and imperatives? Um, this comes out as the two properties, epistemic authority. Um, so the idea here is that the speaker has perfect knowledge of what is necessary with respect to the salient prioritizing model flavor R. And um, epistemic uncertainty, um, it is not, if not for the current utterance, the director or speaker holds possible both phi and not phi, so the prejacent of their imperative. And in addition to that, the context has to be either practical, which means that the question and the discussion is a decision problem for the instigator, in our case, the addressee, and the contextually salient model flavor R is decisive. So a lot of this rests on decisiveness to be unpacked in the next. The other option is that the context is not practical and cannot be construed as practical and is instead expressive. And then um, the model flavor R encodes the directors, or in this case speakers, effective preferences. So realistic, consistent preferences following roughly Kundavaki and Lawa's work here. Okay, so that's um, the requirements on a context in which a model becomes performative and in which an imperative is felicitous. Um, to unpack further this idea of decisive modality. So um, given that we have a context set and a salient partition delta, which um, reflects a decision problem on the context set. So think of this as um, the set of propositions that um, describe the possible actions the RC in this case could take. A model flavor is decisive if it constitutes the contextually agreed upon criteria to choose the preferred self. So what do we need for that roughly? Well, um, first of all, for the decision problem, it means um, that our instigator um, is, uh, it is possible that they um, try um, each of the cells. So none of the cells is excluded by the context set that they would try carrying them out. And um, it is entailed by the context set then that if they try, they um, cause um, the cell to become realized or cause the world to be in that cell. And that's um, a way of reflecting the idea that if it's a decision problem, then we want the agent to control um, these propositions or be able to reliably bring them about. And finally, um, how to characterize decisive modality. It should imply minimally that um, if uh, um, a cue is necessary according to the modal flavor no participant in the context ef effectively prefers the negation. Um, if um, a delta is a decision problem for a participant alpha, alpha tries to find out if one of the cells is necessary according to this modal flavor. And if it, the participant um, learns that something is necessary according in this modal flavor, um, then they try to realize it um, for propositions 
in um, this decision problem. And that goes back to joint work with um, Stefan. And um, so how does this apply to imperatives? So for the practical cases for commands, the model flavor can be the speaker's orders. Um, for disinterested advice, it can be the addressee's goals. Um, for invitations, I was assuming it can be the addressee's desires according to which it is then best to have a seat. And for acquiescence, um, I was also assuming that it's the addressee's goals. So it's very similar to invitations um, for the um, ex morally expressed proposition. For the expressive cases, we just draw on the second clause. So no control um, for settled um, wishes in particular. Note also that the addressee can even be absent. Please be rich. So expressive. So the model flavor um, are going to be the speaker's effective preferences. And for imperative wishes that are not settled, but are issued in soliloquy, so there's no addressee um, who can uh, respond to them, I also assume that it is the speaker's effective preferences. So um, this predicts indeed that all imperatives are subject to the distancing bound that comes from decisive modality or practical and felicity number two, but it predicts that all practical imperatives yield practical more sentences. That was Mandelkern's practical infelicity number one. And that follows from this assumption that the speaker is committed to proposition expressed. Um, they have this um, epistemic authority condition and um, decisive modalities in place. Um, so this is um, just applying a work if then on obviation effects elsewhere. Um, so that is predicted. We are not predicting that expressive imperatives are subject to practical more sentences. And indeed that seems borne out. Oh my God, where are you? Please be in that room. It's fine, even though where are you clearly indicates that I do not know if you are in that room. So I hold it possible that you're not. I do not know where the keys are. Please have them with you. Again, um, no practical more effect. And that's what comes out from them not being in the practical bin, but being in this um, expressive elsewhere bin. And um, model verbs are again predicted to pattern with imperatives um, depending on the modal flavor they combine with. Um, with other modal flavors, they might not uh, show practical infelicities. And um, that leaves the room for the default subjective models um, to be forced to behave like imperatives in the absence of over source modification, which is all good news, I guess. But why would this disjunctive meaning, practical versus expressive, be crosslinked with sickly stable. That looks kind of ugly. I mean, it looks like um, an elsewhere um, case disjunction. And um, hope indeed comes from Greek in um, Despino Economos dissertation. She observes that in Greek, true imperatives, so morphosyntactic imperatives, are not used for wishes. So you don't do get well soon with the imperative, you would use a subjunctive instead. However, bad news um, Greek has wish imperatives after all. Um, as she confirms um, by email um, in this context where you are uh, waiting for hours and I see my husband approaching and he's still out of earshot, I can see, please have to keep it with you uh, with um, the half imperative here. Uh, so same form in Greek. Uh, so it is an imperative, settled imperative here um, used for um, a wish. Um, Looking at them more closely, we do notice that these wish imperatives are in fact practical optatives. So um, comparing with a main clause conditional antecedents, we have indicative and subjunctive optatives. So you can have something like if only he comes in time, if only he had come in time, which at this point is not realistic anymore. The imperatives um, retain in a way realism so they can only be indicative optatives. So only the first kind but also they seem to retain something practical. So in the same context that we just looked at with please have the keys with you, um, if we compare with the um, subjunctive form, so this is the as subjunctive in Greek, um, what um, there's been a report here, it's like an imperative, I put some effort to bring about the desired result. The wish can just be a desperate wish without any attempt. So that's on the one hand interesting because it really um, fits this idea that this is an imperative used um, to express a wish. And it also would want us to maybe 
um, try for a unification after all. I don't know quite how, so we could think about a decision problem for nature or the universe, which I think Sven Lauer has proposed to me, um, or probably it comes from a, an abuse of effective preferences. Anything like that would be interesting, but in any case, it does seem that uh, the imperative semantics should truly capture um, the practical uses and um, the wish uses. And um, to learn a bit more about that and probably also um, reconsider um, a probably natural temptation to at this point say that, well, maybe the wish imperatives are just indirect in a way. So maybe there are some sort of uh, pretend use of the directive form, something like that. I would like to look a little bit more at the cross-linguistic um, picture with uh, directive subjunctives. And for that, um, it makes sense to start out with what I consider a third person subject puzzle about directive subjunctives. So um, true morphosyntactic imperatives, of course, have second person-ish at least subjects, but subjunctives allow for any person value. So who is supposed to act, be the instigator, when the subject is third person? And if we look into the literature, we indeed see two possibilities. View number one is directive subjunctives with third person subjects always place C to its that obligations on the adversary. On the other hand, we could assume that C to its that obligations on the adversary tend to arise, but are not part of the conventional meaning. So both of these have been proposed if for different languages, Sonatini for English and uh, Boipuri and uh, Italian and Isaac um, assumes this across the board. Adrian Stegowitz has proposed this um, for Slovenian um, that there is no C to it that in the semantics. Let's see what happens. And it does seem that indeed it does uh, depend on the language. So this is just the first step at this. If you look at a case where um, there is um, choice of action and a decision problem and the adversary is in control, um, like when a teacher is talking to an assistant teacher about a rambling student and says something like, he should really shut up. And in English, we can also paraphrase, there's a C to it that he shuts up. Then both the Romanian subjunctive and the Slovenian nai subjunctive are felicitous. However, if we toy with the context and look at a case where there is a decision problem, so someone is supposed to um, choose an action in a way, but both of the speaker and the advocacy lack control, so the instigator has to be a third party, um, then we see uh, that the data come apart. So in 30, you have a Slovenian nice objective, which roughly translates to um, this Pope should really change his view on contraception. So that's an example actually from Nainan's paper with English must. And um, you have the nice objective with um, the verb change here. Um, that is felicitous. And it clearly does not mean see to it that this Pope changes his view on contraception because uh, there's no point in me telling you in a no normal conversation that you make the Pope change uh, their view. And um, that was the point of um, the Ripnano's example. Um, not the literal same example, but very, um, and hopefully um, irrelevantly different only, very similar, hopefully irrelevantly different. Uh, we are watching a rambling politician um, on television or at a rally. And uh, I say to you, um, he, um, Sh shut up was the was the subjunctive. Um, the observation is that it cannot mean he should really shut up, as we had it here with Slovenian. In Romanian, what we get is see to it that he shuts up, and correspondingly, uh, in such a context, so these two contexts share, I think, this relevant property. And the Slovenian nice subjunctive is fine, but the Romanian sub subjunctive is unacceptable. And other than that, they both look like um, good cases of as main clause subjunctives used for directive speech acts. And um, there's a caveat here, there seems to be two groups of Romanian speakers, so Daniel Isaac and uh, Donka Farkas clearly have uh, these kinds of judgments. Uh, Simona Herdon's judgments are a bit more complicated, and she confirmed actually with further speakers that there is a bit of a split with Romanian, but this variant is um, discussed in published work, and um, there's, it seems easy enough to find more speakers that share these judgments. In any case, these two cases um, come apart. 
with that, we might not wonder, well, what happens if we do go back and uh, put a second person subject into these subjunctives? And it turns out the Romanian C to that subjunctives start behaving roughly like imperatives. So open the door imperative and as a subjunctive open the door, um, they um, roughly mean open the door, you should open the door, roughly the same thing. And Daniela Isaac in personal conversations uh, confirms the things she has said in her book. A 2015 book on imperatives. Um, the subjunctive is a bit more indirect and it adds politeness to the commands. There is no detectable difference for invitations or permissions. What happens in Slovenian? Well, nice subjunctives, trying to use them um, directively with second person subjects is simply infelicitous. This is discussed in Adrian Stigowitz's uh, 2019 paper. And he suggests that this is indeed the case because they're blocked by imperatives. So we see one form meaning roughly the same and one form um, being indeed even blocked by imperatives. Well, what happens if we look at wishes? It turns out the Romanian subjunctive, the one that had the C to it that component, reliably has its C to it that component. It doesn't like to express wishes. So please be there can only be a future directive about some future occasion where I want you to be there and I request from you to be there. It doesn't, um, sorry, this is the imperative. So it has that reading, but it also has the settled wish reading. So I can also uh, talk about a situation where it's settled already and say like, oh, please be there. I really need your signature or something like that. However, when I use the subjunctive, I still have to direct the future reading. So please be there um, when uh, people arrive later but I do not get the settled wish reading anymore. Please be there. I really need your signature. Um, so um, the Romanian um, subjunctive um, seems to reliably have to see to it that component. The Slovenian I, as I said, uh, truly like an imperative. Um, like the imperative, please be smart, um, which blocks in this case, uh, the nice subjunctive, has the wish reading. Um, and um, the nice subjunctive was the third person where it is not blocked by the morphological imperative, like here, um, also has a wish reading. Please let him be smart. Um, please that he is smart is apparently um, can be used as a wish. Okay, so we see two, um, as it seems, good directive subjunctives, interestingly parametrized. Um, Slovenian really liked imperative, Romanian a little bit different. Second person subjects blocked in Slovenian because same as imperative, probably um, okay in Romanian. C to it that for the RSC can arise pragmatically in Slovenian, um, seems encoded conventionally in Romanian. And when we try wishes, they follow suit. Um, they're okay with the Slovenian, but they are out with the Romanian um, directive subjunctive. Um, now it's tempting to assume that we have. Um, more syntactic imperatives and Slovenian nice subjunctives licensed by a model operator that behaves exactly as we had it before for imperatives in general, um, epistemic authority, epistemic uncertainty, and the context is practical or cannot be construed as practical and is expressive, okay? In Romanian, however, um, we can assume that we have the same thing, only that we don't have the um, cannot be construed as practical and expressive course, so we are stuck with the requirement that the context be practical. And um, so what we see is that um, directive subjunctives, which at first look very similar, are um, mildly parameterized apparently. And um, with that, it's interesting to um, take a look at the last type of um, directive um, minor course types. And those are the root infinitivals in um, directive use. Um, as I said earlier, German bare infinitivals in root clauses are known to work for um, commands and instructions, pretty much like imperatives, hinsetzen, sit down. Um, then rice langsam kochen, let the rice boil slowly, or maybe um, the rice is to be boiled slowly, something like that, um, taken from Hans Martin Gärtner's paper here. And um, unlike imperatives, they don't seem to activate a social relationship between a speaker and addressee. So this now builds heavily on uh, Paul Kutner's work um, with co-authors, um, where they discuss Italian infinitivals and Korean indirect imperatives, which are a little bit more 
uh, complicated, so I'll compare with Italian infinitivals a little bit. Interestingly, if we look at the German um, root infinitivals more carefully, we see that they have two types of use. One are um, generic instructions or requests, um, as in signs or in general rules. And those are the cases where we don't have an interlocutor address C, so there's no specific individual um, we are talking to, um, again, in um, Fortner et al.'s terminology. And this contrasts with the second type of use, where we do have a specific address C, so we do have an interlocutor address C. But interestingly, the usually obligatory choice uh, between formal and informal addressing in German, you will see, like, for, uh, like also French to go, um, can remain unspecified. And this can also be abused to avoid it in cases where you want to um, get around it in a way, having to settle this question how you address your addressee. And um, in contrast to what has been said in the literature, they aren't really only commands. So um, clearly we can have things like, uh, bitte nicht aufregen, please don't get upset, which is more of a plea or imploration than um, a command. Um, we do have cases of permissions, at least in um, published work, um, we can go from whenever uh, feel free to call me if you need anything. So this um, works. And um, we do have probably even acquiescence. I'm not so sure about that. This is something uh, von Finland ihr Trido um, reject as is. I'm hot, uh, can I open the window? I'm using the polite form here because I have an easier time. Klar, machen Sie es ruhig auf. Um, sure, go ahead, open it would be the imperative, the polite form here. Uh, in the same context, klar, ruhig aufmachen. Um, sure, go ahead, open it with the infinitable. I don't think it's as hopeless as they presented. Um, but I think it's interesting why this is harder to get than say the permission. And one thing to note here is that unlike what we have seen with imperatives, the non-command root infinitivals want modifiers. So we see please pop up, we see the modal particle ruhig pop up. Um, we again see a combination of sure, klar, and ruhig pop up here. And I think this is crucial. And um, now, what happens if there is no practicality? Those were all cases that weren't really directives, but they still had a practical component. Well, if we look at imperatives in the absence of a control for the addressee or a decision problem, they turned um, into these kinds of directive wishes and needed to be realistic, epistemically possible. Uh, so we have something like, please have the keys with you, please be tall. But um, no matter if I try, please be 20 again, or just be 20 again, this just fails. So in this case, because it's not um, realistic, so it's not a realistic optative, it um, is bound to fail. If, however, we look at root infinitivals in such cases, we see something completely different. Um, they turn into optatives about the speaker. So if I try something like a bit of the Schlüssel dabei haben, please um, have the keys with you with the infinitival, what I'm getting is still the future oriented directive. If I try, please be tall um, with um, the infinitival, it's mostly weird um, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me. However, if I try this um, bitte noch einmal 20 sign um, without bitte, so bitte is not good here, but noch einmal 20 sign, all of a sudden, I get a perfectly good optative ah, to be 20 again. Um, so for one thing, this is now unrealistic. So it's a kind of factual wish. And for the other, it's about the speaker, not about the addressee. So the prison parameter has switched. However, these root in infinitival directives prohibit reflexives um, normally. And um, so you don't have, if you um, have something like uh, sit down, in sets in which normally wants a reflexive, self sit down, basically, you can't have a reflexive, so you just drop it. The infinitival optatives, however, require them. Ah, um, sich uh, mich hinsetzen, so I do want a reflexive here uh, to sit down. Um, so I would think that they just are not the same structure. So it, with that, um, we conclude that root infinitivals, um, the reflexive less structure are um, simply practical, just like the Romanian um, directive subjunctives. But then in addition, we have this issue with um, the speaker addressee relation playing a role. That's what you're not seeing here, but that's um, what plays a role. 
The classical question um, discussed abundantly is where does the modality come from for um, the root infinite variables? And I would like to propose that indeed it is encoded conventionally again, so we would have a strong theory for the directive infinite variables. Um, here's more on indifferent sequences that I'll spare you for the moment. But we can look at rising intonation. So tentative evidence for the presence of modality across the board comes from what happens with rising intonation. With imperative, the auf, get up, um, gets a reading like, should you get up, maybe? So it becomes a suggestion. Um, and there's a theory on this without modality, but um, I'll set it aside for the moment and just um, proceed with the idea uh, to say that the modality survives. It's about, should you get up, maybe? And the same happens if we look at root infinite tables, aufstehen. So this would have to be something like Aufstehen. And um, it can have two meanings, I think. The one is the same as the imperative has, the suggestion, should you maybe get up now? Um, and the other one is different. The other one is um, an answer expecting practical question. So should I get up? Do you want me to get up? So the instigator has switched here. And um, the root infinite table, I think, allows these both um, readings. Both of them are model. And um, the fact that uh, rising intonation retains prioritizing modality in imperatives and infinite intervals, I think, is a good argument in favor of assuming that uh, the prioritizing modality is encoded in both of them. And um, finally, um, just um, a few comments on uh, the idea that the participant relation is somehow lacking in these root infinite intervals. Um, so translating from uh, uh, Pac, uh, Portner and Zanutini as recent uh, squib on Italian, we get the same effects in German. So um, bring a picture of the place where you live, um, bring a photo from an Ort, in dem du lebst, um, wonderful was the imperative, and photo from an Ort, bring in dem du lebst, um, I've replaced the imperative with the root infinitival, um, and that is weird as a directive, but okay, of course, as a constituent answer to what shall I do? And it's not just the second person, it's also the um, first person. Um, bring a photo um, from the Ort, an dem ich lebe. Imperative, fine, bring a picture of the place where I live. And photo from the Ort, bring an an dem ich lebe. Um, with um, the first person here and the root infinitival is weird. Um, other than as a constituent answer to what shall I do? So it seems that even uh, placing them in a relative clause that's contained in the root infinitival um, makes for um, infelicitous utterances or at least infelicitous directives. And funnily, we can get around this was fixed reference across different contexts of reception um, uh, for infinitival um, directives with um, Italian uh, qui here or li there, um, it works if we have a sign with like an error or pointing finger or also affix to an object that provides the referent of the indexical. So here's some uh, cases, um, la charte de chiavi qui, um, schlüssel hier einwerfen, translating to drop the keys here, root infinitivals with here and they're just fine. Just first person appears to be doomed, and I particularly like this example um, with a sign on a plant that they have, a plant that says, carries a sign, Banjermi, um, or a German, Mich Kiesen, um, with the intention to say, water me, something like that. And that remains bad, despite the fact that me here, the object, the plant, is um, reliably there and should provide a reference. But why is that? So actually talking to Stefan, he suggested that maybe this is a syntactic issue after all. Um, Banyan Mich Giesen has uh, the object realized, which refers to the director, and we could have them without. So um, in German, Giesen would be perfectly fine. Banyara in Italian probably as well. And if that's true, it should improve if we have a reason to realize this reflexive here. Um, bitte nur mich gießen. Um, in a fiare solo me, so instead of banyare, my speakers prefer in a fiare. Please water only me, not the other plants here. Same sign, same plant speaking to you, and it's much better. So for Italian speakers, say, well, it's a little bit weird, but it's so much better than the original version. 
Um, or imagine a hotel key, mich bitte nicht mitnehmen, me, you shouldn't take a long place with a contrastive topic, me. Um, I think that's perfectly fine. And um, Fabio Del Prete came up with an example where we have an actual absent speaker, not the pretending object after all, sign in a public restroom, me, the cleaning person, um, Respettare prego il mio lavoro per, per il vostro benessere. Please respect my work for your comfort. And um, it, uh, German, I think, is the same. So you can have the, um, the um, root infinitival to realize this with the first person uh, pronoun. The ones that have a specific address here are even easier. Um, everyone look at me, please. Bitte alle zu mir schauen. Root infinitival is first person. Guardare a me per favore. Same thing in Italian, root infinitival directives with um, overt um, first person pronouns are fine. And um, Hans Martin already had an ex interesting example with a vocative. Du, bitte aufpassen. Hey, pay attention, please. And this um, vocative is the second person um, familiar um, form. Um, and that works as well. And that's particularly interesting if we assume that evocatives realized interlocutor um, in the structure. Now, um, updating this, and I think I'm receiving that I should be um, uh, wrapping up. We are over time, I agree. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Um, uh, we have to update this a little bit so there's no general lack of indexicals. Minimally, maybe we want assessment stability, so same referent for each recipient for science. And um, the speaker to C relation can remain fully unspecified, but um, it can also be unspecified overtly by vocatives. Um, and maybe also by pleas or modal particles. So maybe they play a similar role in somehow um, specifying a speaker addressee relation. Um, and um, maybe this is required for non commands for reasons that are not entirely clear to me. There are some ideas floating in the literature, but that seems to be happening. Um, interestingly, even um, if we have the modal particles, formal informal can remain unsettled even in non commands. And um, to conclude, I would assume that the bare infinite tables now have um, a modal operator as well. And um, uh, in this case, it would be an ought to do operator combining with a um, property. And it triggers the same presuppositions like um, we have it with practical imperatives. So they are like um, the Romanian subjunctives in contrast to the Slovenian ones. So no clause for expressive use. Um, and the rules are a bit more flexible as um, we don't have uh, a subject uh, constraint to be second person. So any participant um, can be subject here. And um, uh, the case that this is practical only of course and derives that we get both practical infelicities. So root infinite tables will always be infelicitous but instigator might not do it. And with, um, but director absolutely doesn't want instigator to do it. That would also fall out from this story here. And um, just to wrap up, what I said is that um, I wanted all these director, uh, minor directives to have modality. Um, modal operators licensing them, and they are parameterized in two ways. So they can be either practical or expressive or practical only. They can be propositional um, or property embedding for the root infinitivals. And finally, the root infinitivals can but need not encode certain aspects of participant relations, um, but maybe it is obligatory to encode some, some such thing for the non-command users for reasons not clear here. There are many open questions, but since I have a commentator, I can just leave them tiny and see whatever you stumble over. And thank you so much for listening to me over time here even. Many thanks. Thank you very much. This was very rich and we see the uh, different well, interpretations and on the other side, uh, different ways of expressing. Um, and I'm curious now about Dan's comment. And I think we can share the screen. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. So so that, that that was like an incredibly rich talk. And there's just so much there that I haven't had a chance to process yet, especially some of the details towards the end. And so my, my um, comments, I'm afraid, will be fairly superficial compared to the uh, amazing wealth of richness in the talk. I'm just gonna, let me find the window that I wanna share. It's the pages window, okay. So, okay, can people see that?
Yes. Okay, great. So, um, so I mean, I just, I just, just wanted to make one comment to start off with. This is just something I thought of as, as Magda was presenting just now, actually, and then I'll get to some other stuff that's a little bit more foundational to her theory, um, to her positive theory. So just, just that, you know, um, a, a lot of, uh, many of the examples of non-imperatival um, kind of directive meanings that Magda gave had, you know, either please or bitte in, in parentheses or somewhere in there. And it's like amazing, actually, what can start to sound like a directive when, when you throw please onto the front of it, right? And so I wonder how much work that's doing in the data. This is just really a question for Magda. I, I'm, it, this, is, this wasn't universal to all of her data. But like, if you just take English, um, you know, I'm in the elevator and I say, please, you're on my toe. <laughs> and it's pretty clear that I'm performing a speech act of requesting that somebody move or something like that. I'm teaching my class. I say, please, there are readings to do. Um, it, it just seems to me, you know, likewise, I'm taking care of my children. I say, please, your toys are everywhere yet again. It just seems clear to me that even these sentences that would be unambiguously used in assertoric ways, at least speaking literally, when you throw a please on them, we start going looking for directive uh, speech acts that might be appropriate in this context and somehow related to the to the the thing that's coming afterwards. Now, these are indirect speech acts. I think that should be pretty uncontroversial, um, or at least insofar as you're into indirect speech acts, these should be almost paradigmatic examples. But then there's this funny thing where the word please is this conventional device for signaling that a direct something directive is about to come. And so what does it mean to have an indirect speech act that is signaled by a conventional directive operator or, or, or directive particle or something like that? Um, so yeah, that's just something that I, I would love to hear to say something more about, like, you know, whether the fact that you can put please, like if you stick please in your examples, is it always sound, it tends to sound directive, um, whether we should think of that as like cooking the books in a certain way, right? So just take these sort of sub sentential examples below. Um, if I just say keys here, uh, you know, there are situations where that could mean that could, I could just be saying something about where the keys are, or I could be trying to get somebody to put the keys there. But if I say, please keys here, it's super clear that I mean something directive. Likewise, no dogs could mean that there are no dogs present or, or it could mean no dogs allowed. But if I say, please, no dogs, then it's really clear. Yeah, so, so anyway, I, I, I wonder uh, about the strength of Magda's claims about these non-imperative um, um, uh, expressions for this, for this reason, okay. So that's just, that's really just a question that I would have asked in the Q Q and A if I if I had been a uh, normal participant. So let me just move on to the thing that I I had been sort of thinking about more earlier in the week, and this is something that Magda and I have talked a lot about before. Um, that in her kind of classification of speech acts, I think advice uses turn out to be weirder than she's giving them credit for, and not to obviously fit into the categories that she's got. Okay, and. And I'm 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 at least somewhat tempted. I don't have a real axe to grind here. I'm not sure what to say about these uses either. Um, but I'm at least somewhat tempted to say that there's a real sense in which advice uses of imperatives are are really should be thought of as almost like descriptive imperatives or something like that. Imperatives that are used to sort of assert things or to um, perform some kind of assertoric speech acts. Um, and there's a way in which Magda can get that sort of as a as a side effect, but I think it's not it's not super clear that she can capture all this. So I'm again I'm curious about this. So you know the first thing about advice uses is that you know one of the best ways to sort of disambiguate an imperative to to, to an advice use to, to sort of force the the uh, advice use is to consider uses of imperatives in response to descriptive questions, right? Questions not about um, the immediate um, decision problem facing the addressee, but about some informational thing, right? So you can, in response to the question, what is the best route to Grand Central Station? Somebody can say, take the five train. And that starts to sound like advice rather than a command or a request or something like that, right? And, and this is why Magda talks about disinterested advice and 
says that in this case, it, it seems like the speaker's preferences aren't even that relevant um, because, it's, because it seems like what the speaker's doing here might just be giving the person some information about how to answer this question um, using the imperative. And so like the fact that you can do it in response to these hypothetical questions, you know, you, you could have the speaker say even something like, look, I'm, I'm not even going to Grand Central Station. I, I'm not, I don't wanna go anywhere right now but how one, how would, could one get to Grand Central Station? And still in response to that, you can say, take the five train. Okay. And that's a kind of, um, that's the kind of advice use of an, an imperative. Okay. And so um, at least in some cases, it looks like you can describe these uses of imperatives or react to them by saying that they're right or wrong or true or false, which is a sort of, uh, you know, not, sort of famously not usually available in response to imperatives, right? So if, if somebody says, what's the best route to Grand Central Station and somebody else says, take the five train, um, you know, it's fine for them to respond. That's wrong. The five train isn't running today or no, 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 that's incorrect. The five train isn't running today. And I think even this one. So if, if somebody says, what's the best route to Grand Central Station, take the five train, false that the five train isn't running today, right? I think that's felicitous um, and a pretty natural thing to say. And that's, you know, that's a surprising thing about this, about this case, um, because, you know, it's, it's as, as people like me have often pointed out to Magda, <laughs> it doesn't, it, like, it's a weird thing about imperatives if they're, if they express propositions that they, that we can just not normally um, say that they're false. Um, now it's a little bit, you might, you might, one possible thing that you might say here is that the fact that there is a, a descriptive question that's the QED is like doing a lot of the work here. So what if we have a situation where there's, there's no sort of explicit QED in that way? Um, so maybe the speaker just says, I'm trying to figure out how one can get to Grand Central Station. Now that, that sort of raises the same question, but not as explicitly. In response to that, if somebody says take the five train, then it I think becomes a little bit more awkward to say false, the five train isn't running today, right? So that's a notable difference and I'm not sure exactly what to make of it. It, it makes me worry that we're not dealing, maybe we're not dealing with actual imperatives in some of these responses to the descriptive questions, um, but I'm not sure what to say about that. Um, notably, you still can I think say that's wrong or no, no, that's incorrect or something like that in, in these cases. Um, uh, another thing that Magda said is that in general, the sort of practical uses of imperatives can't be overtly source modified. And I think again, with advice uses, that's not correct, right? So um, somebody says, what's the best route to Grand Central Station? Well, the, the, in response, somebody could say, according to custom, take the five train, but in view of your goal of taking your time and seeing some rats, take the six train, right? And that's, I think an okay thing to say in response, you know, it, it's sort of like you're giving this person advice and there are different possible considerations that could be brought to bear on what is the correct course of action. And so you are sort of highlighting those different, you know, um, those different kind of possible sources of, of uh, considerations and pointing out that different things follow from them. And so related, you know, so, so I think similarly when it comes to practical more data advice uses kind of escape some of some of those generalizations as well. So, um, you know, suppose that I come to somebody comes to me and says, I'm getting advice from a few people in order to find out what the best, uh, find out the best decision about how one might go to Grand Central Station, what would you recommend? And somebody could say, I could say in response, take the five train, I don't know if you will, but in my opinion, it's the best way to go, right? And so, uh, it, you know, it's not, there's an interesting question about how important it is that the two things are conjoined, right? So maybe take the five train, but I don't know if you will. Um, sounds a little bit worse there, but as long as you can sort of fit this, um, fit this kind of explanation of why you're saying, I don't know if you will, and somehow it seems like it's okay to me. And so I, I you know, again, I wonder what, what's, what's going on in that case. Um, and then finally, there's this issue about Magda's epistemic authority presupposition, which is part of what does the job for her of turning um, 
the kind of modals that are in the LF of of the LFs of uh, imperatives into these sort of necessarily practical things as opposed to as opposed to descriptive things. Um, so imagine this conversation where, you know, I I say to a group of people, I have convened this panel of my most trusted advisors to find out how to get to Grand Central Station. What say you? And I've got, you know, four people in front of me and one of them says, take the five train, it's the fastest way. Another one says, I disagree, take the six train, it's much less crowded. Another one says, no, take the G to the seven train. Queens is so beautiful at this time of year. Um, and finally, somebody says, walk, I say, I saw someone cutting their toenails on the subway yesterday. Um, and I, you know, it, it, it seems like, so I, I talked to Magda about these kinds of cases at, after a previous talk that she gave, and um, she suggested maybe we could construe this as a kind of metalinguistic degree, disagreement about who is the authority in this context or something like that. But I, I don't think that's quite right, right? It's like a, it's sort of built into the context that all of these people are authorities and, they're, and they have different perspectives. And the speaker is going to, or the, the person who's asking for advice is going to weigh their perspectives against each other. And so you could see, see the speaker even saying like, thank you all for your excellent advice. You are valued epistemic authorities, right? Like, like it's, there's, it doesn't seem like one of them has to win uh, the, the, um, the disagreement in order for this to have been a felicitous exchange. And, you know, I, one thing I just thought about while Magda was talking is that this interacts in weird ways with what she says about decisive modality, right? So, you know, at, at least in this example, it's not clear to me that this is a necessary feature of examples like this. Um, at least in this example, the disagreement here is a disagreement in part about what the criteria are by which we're supposed to choose the preferred cell, right? And so decisive modality, according to Magda, is this condition on, on these practical uses of imperatives where, um, or it's a, it's a presupposition that sort of guarantees that they have these practical meanings, um, which is supposed to be that, you know, it's common ground that there is an agreed upon criteria by which to choose. And you might think part of what's going on, at least in many advice uses, is that it's no, it's not yet common ground what, um, what the cri preferred criteria are by which we should choose. And so in this case, where you've got a where you've got the disagreement before the between the different advisors, the one way to make that feel really natural is that you know they're they're giving advice on the basis of different criteria, and that those are the criteria that the speaker has to weigh against each other. But again, in that case, it's not really clear to me that these advice uses fit cleanly into Magda's um, uh, Magda's kind of um, classification scheme. Um, and then finally, like one thing that I was always tempted by was the idea that at least in these advice uses, what we have is a kind of indirect speech act, right? You're kind of I, you're you're either telling somebody what to do in the case of you know interested advice, or making as if to tell them what to do in the case of disinterested advice, as a way of indirectly informing them, you know, or giving them the answer to their question. And so Magda had a, a test for when we've got an indirect speech act early in the early in her slides. Um, and I think it, uh, I forget where, who, who you took it from Magda, but you use it in a couple of places as well. And I'm a little bit skeptical about this test for reasons that I'll get to. Um, but in this case, I think it, it gives us sort of at the very least conflicting, um, conflicting, uh, upshots. And so the, the test is basically to, to see whether somebody has performed an indirect speech act is it. Uh, of of doing you know y by doing x can you can you felicitously report them as having done y by doing x um, and and so in this case suppose we've got this original case what is the best route to Grand Central Station um, the addressee says take the five train well here are some things that we here are some like I think felicitous ways that we could report this a informed us how to get to Grand Central by telling him to take the five train. Uh, a informed S about how to get to Grand Central by directing him to take the five train. That actually seems okay to me. Um, A explained how to get to Grand Central by telling him to take the five train. So, you know, like our, whether you think of these as speech act verbs or not is an interesting question, but there's a complication because a, a cert tends to really want to be used as a way of talking about in, about direct speech acts. And so it's, it's I, I think, the, but it, it, it seems to me that inform and explain are, are, are verbs that we do use to report speech acts. 
And then, you know, the, I, I was less sure about this one. A advised S to take the five train by telling him to take it. That's a little bit of a weird one. Um, um, but I, I'm, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm just not really sure what to make of this pattern of data. And so th this is a way of asking Magda for clarification on like when we should be using this, this, uh, this sort of reporting test and when it, you know, when we can't sort of trust it. And just, I'll, I'll get to a little bit more about that in a second. I, uh, how many minutes have I been speaking? Am I going over already? Uh, yeah, a little bit, just like your, your, uh, um, okay. um, uh, yeah, just in that market. Okay. So we are a little bit learning. learning. Okay, I'll, I'll, let me just do one more minute. Is that okay? Yes, thanks. Okay. Okay. So then I just this last thing I wanted to talk about wish uses of imperatives. So the there are these ones where the where there is an addressee, like when you say to somebody get well soon, but it's like, you know, they have no control over that. And it seems like you're just expressing some desire that they get well soon. Um, and then there are these ones that don't have addressees. And I and I just I think like, Magda has a lot of things to say about these and her patterns of uh, her cross linguistic patterns of when they're they can be done are really interesting and and I have no idea what to say about them. But I but I, in general, I'm tempted to just say, maybe we should take a step back here and ask like what are what are they like what are people like, trying to accomplish with these things. Why would using imperatives be a good way to accomplish those things and I, I, I it just seems to me that although we've got a lot of data on the table here, it's not even really clear what our desiderata for a theory of these uses should be yet. And, and so I was hoping Magda could say just a little bit more about what she thinks about that. And particularly the audience list ones, I don't have, I mean, I've been thinking for a while about what audience list speech acts are supposed to be and why we do them. And so I wonder if Magda has stuff to say about that. Like what, like speech acts seem to me to be these like communicative things, right? And so I, I, I so you know, Magda calls these uses expressive, but why? What are we expressing? Why are we expressing them? Why would we use imperatives to do that? Those strike me as questions that are really deep and hard. And it's not that I expect Magda to have to have like a whole theory of audienceless utterances to make sense of them, but um, but I I just find this I I find I, I often find myself when discussing these things in a situation where I feel like we're plowing ahead giving a theory without yet having decided what, what what goals we're trying to achieve with the theory, because I find that the existence of these uses so puzzling in the first place. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about the rest. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks, Magda, for an awesome talk. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Magda. So uh, let's say you have five minutes to select uh, topics, and then I would like to give a chance for some of the other guests to pitch in. And if they don't have anything to say, then you can back uh, can go back to other issues that Dan raised. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'll try to be very brief. I mean, just to say a couple of things, and then let's start with the last one. So for the wishes, I agree with you, and that was one of the puzzling things that came up. So I think it was important to see this this split is kind of stable so we don't quite know what the wishes are and the interesting thing is with morphosyntactic imperatives we find it over and over with other forms we don't see it so that i think tells us that whatever is going on is not just we take whatever kind of directive combination of um say conventional semantics and pragmatics imperatives are we can use that to somehow express ourselves or like whatever we are doing but uh there is more to it and um that's that's why i found it also so interesting to think about like what is the pragmatic what is this practical trace that people sense when they um utter imperative wishes we don't quite know and um is there a way of unifying them with that we always like imperatives in a way minimally what they do is like to they select something as in some way optimal or at least one of the optimal solutions which is very much what i think is going on with these cases where people say like it should be a possibility um it's like we just need one answer and let's take this any is as good as as, as long as we have one thing that's optimal let's go with it and yes uh, but but that is really all i can say but i i would just really want to emphasize i think it's important to keep track of the fact that people feel it's not the same as an optative wish as you also say why are we doing this 
And I think for an intentionalist theory, it's also a problem, right? Because I'm not trying to put anyone into any sort of mindset, but it's it, that's why I'm kind of happy with this expressive for the moment. But I think it's very important to see that there is the split with uh, their active forms. That's all I have for the moment. Um, to say a little bit about the advice, this, this made me in a way smile because when I first came up with a propositional theory of imperatives, exactly what you're saying that people sometimes say, but here I can say it's true and here I can say it's false was what kind of gave me hope that it's not completely off to put a model semantics in there because most people think it's just crazy to have a proposition for the imperative. So yes, and in the dissertation I even have, and, and also in the book I have these where I say like, well, look here, it's not so bad to say that's not true. So I'm very much on board with you. I'm a little worried with some of the cases uh, that you have, like the fully descriptive one, like how could one uh, get to Grand Central? I don't think they're fully felicitous in German when I have a more syntactically marked imperative. So I think we have to be very careful with English because it's not very good at really nicely marking its imperatives. And sometimes we might slip in something that's probably just an infinite table after all. I don't want to say it is, but I think it's worth noting that um, in German, it feels a little bit harder to get uh, the imperative in the case where I'm saying something like, we can't demand to a grand central common. How could one get to grand central? Nimm die fünf. I think what happens if I use the imperative, it's that I am kind of introducing like hypothetically you want to do this if you were to want to do this. So we are morally subordinating under, um, I feel like um, a context where we're, we're accommodating a decision problem tentatively. And um, again, for the intentional, this, isn't this horrible? Like if you can have the imperative there, so maybe my answer is, is good news for you too. I don't know. And um, I think one very important point you raised is what's going on with source modification and um, disagreement about probably what the criteria even are. Um, that's definitely something I have to think about more. I think it's surprisingly hard to tease apart that we are disagreeing about the kind of criteria to use. Like for instance, if um, for instance, if comfort is or or uh, speed or whatever is to play a role or if I want to say like well let's push it back into the content of the criteria so the criteria are always something like um how does one get there um but then we are disagreeing about for instance I mean in the Kratzer style framework you have to form conjunctions to make to 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 get rankings basically so, so Paul has a better theory of how to induce rankings within ordering sources but like a very in a very dumb way we could have we could conjoin the ones that are most important to all the others so they win out and things like that so um, in that sense we could probably push it down to the content of the criteria and then I would as you said have to stick with this idea that we are basically fighting it out who has the better idea of what really um, should be in um, the teleological uh, criteria. Um, and the last point you mentioned, uh, just to highlight that was please, I fully agree that we don't have a good theory for please. Some of the things you said were super interesting, the things like no dogs are um, perfectly good descriptive speech acts as well. I think that's that's also interesting how does this happen? And um, that please uh, forces a directive. I think it's also interesting. For the cases I had, I was more meaning to say that you have a form that doesn't do anything unless you put in please. It's not like it becomes directive. It's more like some of them you can kind of save if you start encoding some sort of speaker at receive relation and apparently that's what please does amongst whatever else it does but i also think that please does more than one thing because um this please you are standing you are on my toe and please be rich probably um it does different things and we would like to know what it does i fully agree with you and i just don't know and that's probably a good um concluding remark <laughs> thank you very much for your excellent comments i want the file too so i can think about it